So welcome to the 26th reflection on the prayer of Bersa and the third on the line, let the work of the Church of God be in these hands. Versa's adopted country felt isolated in its haven between the warm North Atlantic and the cold North Sea. One and a half centuries earlier, the withdrawal of the Roman Empire to Europe's east had ushered in for Britain an age of fragmentary invasions and tribal feudings. Now in Versa's day, a new generation of missionaries was arriving to reconnect Britain's isolated Christians with the wider world of the church. In the intervening years, the landscape of this wider world had become strangely altered. Now the call of fealty was not to the emperor firmly established in his Byzantine palace. In Christianity's early days, it was the refusal of such an oath that had cost so many of martyrs, of the martyrs their lives. With the new wave of missionaries, the call of fealty was to new ecclesiastical structures, to protocols and chains of command that stretched to the Mediterranean and to Rome's last vestige of order and administration. The walled city on the Vatican Hill. The watchwords of this new world for the churches were uniformity and order. In this new day, the chief focus was to be on an establishing the new infrastructures of parishes and dioceses, rather than the missionary community of the monastic household. Gone were the old ways of diversity, brotherhood, and the local autonomy of sister churches. Nor were these the only changes. Versus peers were shocked to find that even the calculation of Easter itself had been subjected to change. Goodness me. In Versus' day, each local community was still free to choose which calendar to follow. But only 15 years after Versa's death, the Synod of Whitby required all British Christians to submit to the new method of calculation. The decisive argument was that the monastic method of taking the date of Easter directly from the Gospel of John must surely weigh less than the pronouncement of the hierarchy's most senior prelate. To the Celtic Christian, this institutional world of rank and hierarchy was a foreign world indeed. For all these changes in the expression of church life had taken place, while the Celts had faithfully continued in their more primitive expression of Christianity, innocent in their isolation. Versa's world was the more primitive world where the strong centre of a region's Christian life was invariably to be found in a small residential forms of church. In his time, the properties formed by monastic brothers and sisters were not seen as enclosures shut away from the church's mission. They were its lifeblood, the very source of its energy and manpower. Versus was a world, as Bede reminds us disapprovingly, where bishops deferred to the monastic leaders and not vice versa, and where public services at liturgy were performed not at the centre, but at the fringe of Christian ministry often by monastic brothers with a priestly license. Versus was a world of small, local communities bound together not by cords of institution and protocol, but by the stuff of soul friendship and a shared family history. 
the Apostle Paul in his letters of Ephesians and Colossians and the Apostle Peter in his letter to the Diaspora both lay out the revelation of how the kingdom of God was to come through the church of Jesus Christ. This apostolic revelation names the particular relationships that are key to making a vision, that vision a reality. Arrestingly, the relationships named are not the hierarchical relationships of institutional life but the relationships of husband and wives, parents and children, masters and slaves. In the apostolic vision, the household of God subsisted most authentically in the household of God's people. This was a vision with roots in the rich testimony of the Jewish way of worship. For in Passover, Sabbath, in teaching and prayer, the continuing tradition of the Old Testament centers a liturgy of faith upon households of faith. But Fursa, in his generation, protected by their long isolation, this was still the model and the infrastructure of the Christian church. Even as a team of celibate workers, Versus bands structured their ministry on households living together as brothers. As we have seen, two of Versus' brethren were his own blood brothers, Foylian and Alton. For this was truly a family household. Historically, it is a language that denotes the people's group we now call Celts. In the language of Fursa's people, we still hear the echo of this very human grassroots expression of church life. Words meaning home and heart, affection and family, brotherhood, sisterhood and soul friendship. To the Celtic ear, these were the words that expressed the way of church. Paul says, church programs today often segregate the ages and genders, fragmenting the community of family. Adults into groups for adults, children into Sunday school and young people into youth groups. He says, perhaps versus primitive world may show a better way. What do we think? Do we think it shows a better way? Or do we need to have that separation? Or do we need to have balance? What do you think? And what does it say to our households and living the Christian gospel within our families and witness to the world or witness to where we are? Be in our hands. May the yoke of the law of God be on my shoulder, the coming of the Holy Spirit on my head, the sign of Christ on my forehead, the hearing of the Holy Spirit in my ears, the smelling of the Holy Spirit in my lips, the vision of the people of heaven in my eyes, the speech of the people of heaven in my mouth the work of the church of God in my heart, the good of God and of neighbour in my feet. May God dwell in my heart, and may I belong entirely to God the Father. Amen. Heavenly Father, thank you that we are here as your church. We pray for the church throughout the world that we might be encouraged where there is growth even in times of great distress and persecution. We think of the church in China 
where members actually outnumber members of the Communist Party there. We think of the church in North Korea. We think of the church in the Middle East, in Syria and Iraq and Iran, where it brings hope and forgiveness. Lord, sometimes we are in despair because we feel that the world does not take you seriously here in our own country. And we look to ourselves and we wonder whether sometimes we are part of the problem. Fill us with your Holy Spirit. Help us to be more daring. We pray for institutions of our church that sometimes we feel are cumbersome and heavy and restrictive. We ask that we might pray for our bishops and those institutions and work with them. To be messengers for you. And we look at our world and we see great sadness and destruction such that we almost reach to switch the television off. Last night there was a program about the people in Syria who labelled labor the, for 10 years in a war that doesn't seem to have an end. Where most of the people are displaced most of them living in poverty and seem to be forgotten. We pray for the children in those situations. There's a little boy of 10 who doesn't go to school, can't read, can't write, and has no future. Lord, sometimes we feel that, again, we are helpless and there's nothing much we can do. Help us to earnestly pray and seek ways of helping and alleviating such suffering. And thank you for today. Thank you that we will together partake in this remembrance of who you are and how you came into our world, into our church, into our lives. And may we be excited anew by your presence, as we remember you in the taking of the bread and the wine. Amen. Let's lift our voices together. My hope is built. My hope is built on nothing less. And Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly trust in Jesus' name. Christ alone. Christ alone.
Christ, Lord of all.